Depending on you, Eric. Do you need anything, Mike? Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks to Ed Tomasini for permitting me to come back here and to talk a little bit about we, something we discussed yesterday, which was March 17th, 2021, in an interview with Dennis Webster. Dennis uh, and I have been doing what now is five parts, and one of the subjects I was talking about yesterday was the Robert H. Jackson Center's continuing legal education programming. And he wanted to know how it got started and other background, and I sort of glossed over the big picture and talked a little bit about one of the premier events, which was Woodstock. Uh, having concluded yesterday, I said, you know, there's much more to that aspect of the Jackson Center, why we got started, and some of the events that have occurred. So uh, this is a supplement uh, to that which occurred yesterday, and it's on the continuing legal education programs that have occurred at the Robert H. Jackson Center. I think I mentioned it, but let me elaborate that one of the things uh, our collaborator early on here was the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation with specific attention to Randy Sweeney. Randy Sweeney uh, not only permitted th us to have our early meetings at the uh, Community Foundation, of which the uh, founders, uh, Carl Kappa, Betty Lene, were original members of the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation, but it also included myself, of which I was the president for a, a five-year period of time, so we have a long-standing connect. Randy opened his doors and as a result uh, was constantly looking, as was I, for programming opportunities and some which could be collaborative. Since they're in the estate planning business, estate administration, gift giving business, uh, and that's course certainly part of the law aspect, uh, it was natural to have some events collectively here at the center sponsored by the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation with sp speakers who related to those subjects. And as um, we started to expand it to include the Jamestown Bar Association and, and, and certain individuals, you'll see that we started as early as 2005, uh, uh, Trust Structures and Tax Planning was really our first event here with the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation, which actually ended up having a brochure and a significant attendance. Uh, we shortly thereafter, on June 9th, 2005, uh, brought in Professor David Siegel, who was the foremost attorney in New York State on civil procedure. He came here from Albany. Of course, that's the same law school of which Robert Jackson attended and he brought greetings from that, as well as the dean came along with him for that particular event in 2005. Um, we continued the subject matter of, again, finding specifically law-related things. In 2006, the overview of the new Bankruptcy Act, uh, which was pretty specific, but nevertheless, we brought in Judge Buckeye, who's the federal district court judge dealing with bankruptcy, and that was kind of cool to have a, our first really federal district court judge here in that form. We also did uh, a presentation where we brought in Ken Joyce. Ken Joyce, probably the funniest law professor one would ever meet. He talked about the, the tax laws, but more importantly, what I remember, and it's on YouTube, is he is listed as the principal speaker of the CLE. And those days, CLEs were usually an hour and a half, two hours, a uh, shorter period of time than we subsequently morphed into. But he said, it looks like I'm the speaker, uh, and the principal speaker, and I'm here to talk about tax law, and you guys are going to fall asleep. So I, he picked up a mug. He picked up a mug, and it was the Robert H. Jackson brown mug. And... Uh, uh, it's something to do with it. we're not final because we're, you know, infallible. yeah, infallible. We're infallible because we're final. Something like that. I just blew, thank you, Ed, off camera. And 
He turned that into a five-minute little talk, just looking at the mug. Spectacular. Spectacularly funny, insightful, and just superb. That was Professor Ken Joyce, and that was his first time here, uh, which then uh, he came back another, another time, because always a packed house. Many of the lawyers from this area went, graduated from the University of Buffalo Law School, and Ken Joyce, for I think 10 years running, was the most popular professor, as voted by the, by the students themselves. Uh, so that was our good friend, Ken Joyce. And shortly thereafter, we had really the first event where we brought in a uh, uh, celebrity. Now, what's that mean? Um, we would have a CLE and usually two or three hours, and then we'd have a luncheon, all of which was free, by the way. It was free because we got sponsors to assist us in covering the costs. And they, why did they sponsor us? In fact, it turned out to be a pretty good fundraiser for the Jackson Center, because they didn't know how to get to attorneys. So they knew if they sponsored something and put up a table, they in turn could get access to attorneys. Otherwise, they were spending a lot of time cold calls and getting nowhere. So that was kind of the, the early gimmick that got everybody interested. And then in 2007, um, we had an event called What's Up, Doc? What's Up? And it dealt with principally uh, kind of new, what's new in the law itself. And again, the Stalker Region Community Foundation. And we had as our luncheon speaker, so we had the CLE aspect of it, and then the luncheon speaker, Robert Suedos. Robert Suedos was the, uh, an attorney with Phillips Lytle at that time, retired. But most importantly, he was the general counsel for the Buffalo Sabres. So think of the go-go years of the Sabres with the French Connection and the whole story of how the Sabres came to be, which wasn't that uh, well known. It just the Knoxes owned it, but the Knoxes had to literally buy a franchise in Oakland, finesse it so it ended up in Buffalo, and the guy behind it all was Robert Suedos. In addition, Suedos, uh, as, a, as a, a retired partner of Phillips Lytle, I interviewed him separately. And I remember going to telling me how he was intimately involved in getting the first Russian out of Russia to play in the National Hockey League, Alexander Mogilny. And it's a cloak and dagger story. Shortly after he told me that in an interview, I was in uh, Russia uh, at the invitation of the Russian judicial system as they were celebrating in 2000, oh gosh, six, the uh, 60th anniversary of the Nuremberg trial. John Barrett and I, and our, I took my daughter, went to Moscow. Never thought I would ever be in Moscow in my life. And there you are in Red Square. Kremlin, the domes, I mean, it just blew me away. I was just moved. And we had an, an interpreter with me the whole time. And I was a young guy. And he said, where are you from? And I said, I'm from uh, New York State. Whereabouts in New York State? And I mentioned Buffalo, New York. And he goes, oh, the terror, the terror. It's you guys who stole Mogilny. You stole Mogilny. It came out of his mouth, and he really got exercised. So I laughed, and I didn't, it, you would not appreciate the story, but my partner was intimately involved behind the scenes of extracting Mogilny here. Now, that story continues on, and we'll get to it, on subsequent CLEs. And it got, again, cloak and dagger story till ultimately, I, I think. Uh, Ed Tomasini has filmed just about the whole story in one form or fashion. But that was really our first. Bob Suedos, that was 2007, um, where we actually brought in a celebrity. So we do the CLEs followed by the celebrity. People stayed around for lunch because everybody wanted to have and hear about war stories. In 2008, uh, we had a program, again, called Shared Services, What You Need to Know. 
which would be, again, benign. In this case, it dealt with shared services, municipalities, how they could share. Stan Lundin was here talking about that time period when uh, municipalities were encouraged to do that. So we had a lot of people, but it was not lawyers, yes. It was law, yes, but we had the towns and the villages all here. And we had as its um, speaker, Eddie Abramowski. Eddie Abramowski was the retired trainer of the Buffalo Bills. He had been that role for like 35 years. Roly poly guy. And he had just written a book on tales from the Buffalo sidelines. Hilarious. Just hilarious. So we passed out the books. We had a sponsor for that. And he told war stories. The place was again packed. Later that year, continuing the sports theme, and particularly the Bills, uh, we had a called the States Here and After, and we had Steve Christie. Steve Christie, uh, again, recently retired from the Buffalo Bills as its field goal kicker, but probably as big a name as there was in the field goal department. Uh, so Steve came here courtesy of uh, Schultz Chevrolet. He had been hired uh, by them to be a spokesperson, so uh, prevailed upon the Schultz folks to come and, you know, make a pitch about Schultz Chevrolet and also to have Steve come here and talk about, be interviewed and the war stories. By the way, most all of these were interview processes. Uh, we did not ask them to give speeches, but also quickly point out that the Chicago Sports Hall of Fame, uh, Randy Anderson uh, would come and be a co-sponsor and what he would do is he would find eight by 10 pictures of the athletes uh, and then set up a table where they could sign to all of the attendees, which was a nice souvenir. Again, back to the attendees, we got programs that were somewhat general in nature, but enough law so the attorneys could get a CLE credits, and at the same time uh, have sports celebrities where you could walk away with this, and it cost you nothing. The attorneys got three, four CLE credits, which is very valuable, a free lunch, and a souvenir. And, uh, and for me, I got to interview a lot of people and we brought in a lot of talent. And um, in 2009, uh, in April, we, the, the topic was who's on board, and it dealt with principally all the not-for-profits of the world uh, to come here and to talk about governance. So it was kind of a, again, popular theme because it affected so many not-for-profits. But our speaker was uh, baby Joe Macy, uh, who had just retired as an undefeated heavyweight contender. And he was spectacular. And he brought his dad down, Jack, and to talk about kind of his career. Again, he's undefeated. He's never been beaten, but had a brain aneurysm and he couldn't, he lost his license. So he couldn't box anymore. And so Joe came down here, and he's a handsome Italian guy. And I tell you, the place was uh, packed. The place was packed. Uh, baby Joe Macy. And then in uh, the following October, it's called Controlling the Local Tax Burden. And uh, Stan Lundin came in again, talked, and he brought in a, a Albany celebrities to talk about that. And our luncheon speaker was Shane Conlon. Shane came back from Pittsburgh at the behest of his good friend, uh, Judge Cass, Stephen Cass. They played football together in Frewsburg, and of course Shane went on to fame and fortune at Penn State, and of course the Buffalo Bills. And Shane signed a boatload of books uh, of Gail Jarrow's. We had just had that delivered. Gail Jarrow is a book on the history of Robert Jackson and Shane signed them all, and they were given to Frewsburg School, and it was, which was a great public relations coup. And of course, Shane was here. Shane signed a bunch of pictures as well. So that was one of the, the uh, again, carrying on with the Buffalo Bills theme. And I'm looking at uh, a scrapbook I have of some of the highlights, and just big headlines, welcome home, Shane. And he hadn't been back for a few years and was, was kind of um, a great interview, but he didn't, doesn't do that. He, he's very uncomfortable doing it, but it worked out well. 
continuing the next year, 2010, um, we had a subject called As the World Turns in the Next Decade. And it was uh, kind of th things that were happening uh, in updates on bonds and charitable gift annuities, what's new in surrogates court. Again, a state's related which applies principally to wealth management people. <coughs> but our speaker was Steve Tasker. You know, obviously of, one, of one of the premier Buffalo Bills during the go-go years. And how did you get a Steve Tasker? Steve Tasker who is uh, an all pro, he's uh, uh, well respected, he's on TV. He was on, this was, you know, he's a commentator for NFL. How did we get him? Well, how that happened was uh, my former partner at Phillips Lytle, Gary Gleba, had left the firm and became the general counsel for West Her. And so even to this day, you can't help but see Steve Tasker as the spokesperson for West Her Auto. And so I prevailed upon Gary to see if Steve might come at no cost or just PR, because we'd plugged West Her. And that's how we got Steve Tasker, who did have a speech. He did have a speech, and it was terrific. Uh, and, um, uh, but then I interviewed him thereafter as well. I didn't want to let that opportunity lose itself. The, the next one uh, we had was entitled, Whatever Will Be Will Be. Really? Que sera, sera. And it talked about New York State legislation, decisions, trusts and estates, municipal dissolutions, which again, another big topic that was going on in the municipalities at the time. And we had scheduled Rick Martin to come down here. Rick Martin, who I had met once before, and he's part of the French Connection. And he agreed to come. Uh, unfortunately, he died. He had a massive heart attack at the, you know, within a week before he was going to come. And so we uh, were saddened by all of this. But we had a, a little bit of a scramble. And so we were able to get Rob Ray. Rob Ray recently retired from the Buffalo Sabres. He's the enforcer. Uh, again, all these are on YouTube, by the way. And I l love the fact of interviewing Rob Ray because he's pugilistic. I mean, that was his claim to fame. Drop the gloves, fight. And you want to know, how does that happen? You can't teach that. It's just some people like to fight. And that was Rob Ray, uh, you know, a pug nose. And, and he just was funny as all get out. Now he's on Sabres TV. Uh, so that's how we got Rob Ray when, unfortunately, Rick Martin could not join us. The, um, the next one is the one we talked about uh, with Dennis Webster and uh, let me just highlight a little bit more. It was called Woodstock, the Music of the First Amendment, featuring Sam Yasger with a very special luncheon speaker, which we couldn't disclose at the time. I, I knew who it was going to be, but I couldn't disclose it. And the reason I couldn't disclose it is, one, the speaker didn't want me to disclose it. Two, uh, the speaker uh, was a musician, subject, and his schedule was subject to change on a moment's notice. And the name was Corey Wells, Corey Wells, lead singer of Three Dog Night. So um, when we contemplated this idea of Woodstock, the music of the First Amendment, one, you had to have some law. That's important to get CLE credits. And obviously, it was uh, uh, an anniversary of sorts with, with Woodstock. And I had reached out and obtained and got to meet and talk to and convince the son of the owner of the property which it was located, uh, and the owner was Max Yasger, he had passed, but his son was Sam Yasger, who happened to be an attorney uh, for Sullivan County. And so I reached out to see if he'd be willing to talk about his dad, his experience of Woodstock, which was much more than I thought. He recently had graduated from University of Chicago Law School and uh, was, was home, you know, in summer with his dad helping negotiate acts and leases and being part of it. So he was definitely there 
and met a lot of people just because he was the son of the owner of the farm. And so he put together, we put together, a four-hour knock-your-socks-off program, uh, the last two of which were Sam Yasger talking about the First Amendment, and he interspersed m music, uh, Joe Cocker, Jimi Hendrix, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, you name it, and, and poignant points about his dad, what it was like on the ground, and some law. He'd actually done some research on Jackson and the First Amendment, which was unbelievable. Uh, I'm repeating somewhat for if you saw the last one, but uh, we uh, prevailed upon the resource center who was making shirts at the time to do tie-dye shirts, and on the front it said Woodstock, the music of the First Amendment, it had the peace sign, and on the back it talked about the, the event and, and, of course, plug in the Jackson Center and the resource center. But we required everybody, we had enough for everybody, we required everybody, if they were going to CLE credits, and even if they weren't, to wear them. So there's a picture of this entire Kappa Theater full of people with Woodstock shirts, including all of the speakers, which was incredible. Now, on top of everything else, we had uh, uh, some of the programming. We had uh, uh, John Marino of the Gebby Foundation spoke about his personal experiences being out there at Woodstock where he went out with his son in his dad's car. And it's, I don't want to give it away, but if I were you, I'd go on YouTube and look it up. It's spectacular. They ultimately uh, couldn't find his brother. They left him there at Woodstock and went back to Buffalo. And then we had uh, uh, such things as the groovy world of long-term Medicaid. Uh, we had a contempt, we did all kinds of stuff. And we had the rule of law, culture clashes, and ultimate resolution. Dennis Roberts was here, and Sam Yasger, and highlight of which was Corey Wells of Three Dog Night, which I'm a fan, huge fan of Three Dog Night. And little did I ever realize I would be interviewing him, which was not a sports guy, but way out of my comfort zone, but I got comfortable pretty fast. And he was terrific. And we ultimately sang at the very end, Jeremiah was a bullfrog to a packed, packed house. Many people just showed up for the, what's the word leaked out? Uh, they came for the lunch, you know, just to see Corey Wells. That was amazing. Um, then <laughs> we're on a roll now with these, now we're starting to get into kind of circus events. The next one was the Buffalo Sabres had just been purchased by the Pagulas in 2010, I believe it was. And so, I thought it'd be kind of fun to bring in all of the attorneys who were involved in that transaction from Pittsburgh and the uh, general, the president of the Sabres at the time, Ted Black. And the reason we had access to Ted was because he was a roommate of Steve Cass. So the president of the Buffalo Sabres, attorney Ted Black, went to Allegheny College, roommate of Steve Cass. So with Steve's introduction, I we convinced him to come down, and when he came, all of his attorneys decided from Pittsburgh to show up to talk about the deal. And in addition, Danny Gare, one of the all-time great Sabres, came to be the speaker at lunch. Why? Because he wanted to impress Ted Black, because Ted Black dis had in his hands the fate of Danny Gare as a sp sportscaster. It all worked incredibly well. So uh, the other piece of that puzzle, because Ted Black was from Allegheny, every speaker, all four hours, was an Allegheny College graduate. Greg Edwards, George Panabianco, Byron Balicki, Steve Cass, and Ted Black. And Eric Springer, who was one of the lawyers in Buffalo, or excuse me, Pittsburgh, was in fact and Allegheny guy, plus Danny guy. I mean, another huge thing. 2012, again, continuing on hot topics, and we didn't realize how hot it was. The question at the time was uh, to frack or not to frack, that is the question. And we got the, through Stan Lundin, the uh, uh, Joseph Martins, commissioner of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, 
the big dog who was deciding at the time whether to frack or not frack. So the place was packed. The sponsors were loaded with every environmental oil and gas company, Meadville, Oil City, they all came here to hear what Joseph Martins was going to say. It was unbelievable. Another packed event, and we had uh, we talked about oil and gas leases, business ethics, and uh, the big thing was Joseph Martens, and we had the Energy and Natural Resources Group of Michael Joy, David Flynn, Darren Suarez, and the featured speaker was Paul Wieland. Paul Wieland at the time was a professor at St. Bonaventure, but most importantly, at the early days, he was the Sabres public relations guy. And Paul was perhaps one of the funniest people ever talking about war stories. In fact, most half of my book is his war stories uh, by Paul Whelan. So you can look it up, as they say, and uh, how at one time he actually created a false press release that the Sabres had drafted a guy named uh, Tojimoto, a guy, there was a press release that went out, and he made up a whole bio on this guy, and all the press, all the uh, national picked up on it, Tojimoto, who never existed. He didn't exist. He made him up, and he created a bio, and he ran with it for like a week until the owner said, who is this guy? He's not on any list, and there's a picture, Buffalo Sabres, you know, you know, uh, player profile, et cetera. So, Paul Whelan. Yikes. Then, in 2012, and I got to pause, because this, this is going to be shown to, but to Mary Keating. This is a I want this to be a love letter to Mary Keating. Mary Keating is the Phillips Lytle uh, secretary, paralegal, major domo, in charge of all continuing legal education. None of this happens unless Phillips Lytle made CLE credits available. I should have started with that. Uh, so Mary and I work glove in hand, and she's the best, absolute best, and she made this all possible. And certain programs, like the one I'm just going to mention next, is really was her idea. It's called Lincoln on Professionalism, and it was a uh, uh, an interesting program because it sort of was Buffalo-based, a look at Buffalo's Presidents, Mary Sacamano Friedman was here. She was the first female uh, president of the, J of the New York Bar Association. She was here and also the founder of the Presidential Center in Buffalo. And then we had Lincoln on Professionalism, which was a, uh, a discussion on Lincoln. Uh, and we had as panelists Judges McCarthy, Piggott, John Plum, and Judge Powers. And I moderated it. And then as we had as a speaker, one of our local claims to fame who went to the NFL, J. Hugh Colcrick, who was a climber, high school graduate, went to Michigan State, was uh, uh, variously mentioned as a All-American, and then played in the NFL for a short period of time with the Jets and Bills. But his life story of being a native of uh, Liberia and getting caught there in the Civil War his dad not getting out from the Civil War, his mother taking Jehu and uh, family members here, ending up at a farm and climber. You know, it's incredible rags to riches story, and Jehu really for the first time talked about it uh, as our guest speaker. Then we got into Chautauqua Lake, The Future Is Now. This was 2013, and we had as speakers, we. Uh, uh, Chautauqua Lake, uh, Jesse Fisher from the Buffalo Niagara River Keepers, Mark Geis and Adam Walters, uh, pa panelist. And our luncheon speaker was Jim Lorenz, who was the uh, uh, long-standing Buffalo Sabres, but also a play-by-play uh, -play guy who worked with, very closely with Rick Jenner, who was the all-time icon of Buffalo Sabres hockey a guy I'd still love to get down there sometime. Uh, but yeah, Chautauqua Lake, and that was really the first time we dabbled in the, uh, the Chautauqua Lake itself. In October of that year, uh, I'd seen this elsewhere. Uh, Mary, uh, Judge Judith Kay, rather. Judge Judith Kay had done something called Scales of Justice uh, in Albany. 
and, and found some Gershwin or something and they turned it into a ceiling. Well, we took the name, Scales of Justice. I told Judge Kay that we did it. And we had here Scales of Justice and Teresa Quinn, who was an entertainment law professional, together with Dennis Drew of the 10,000 Maniacs, and Bobby Militello, famous saxophonist, who played with Dave Brubeck. And we had them here, and they talked about copyright law, trademark, and it was fabulous. And then Bobby, who was stayed around, uh, we uh, interviewed him during lunch on his wonderful experiences in the world of jazz, and it is legendary. Um, I had also at that time had already interviewed Bobby Militello's real claim to fame being Dave Brubeck's saxophone guy. So when you hear the, the song Take Five, you know, in, in a lot of sax, that's, that's Bobby Militello. Um, then another Mary Keating special um, in 2014, Underground Railroad Law and Legacy. And that was one dealing where we have Professor Paul Finkelman come in from Albany Law School to talk about the Underground Railroad and how it worked and how really here at the Jackson Center, uh, I'd like to believe it's true, is in the basement is an actual archway. There is an archway in the basement and we'd like to think this was part of the Underground Railroad. The owners, the Kents, were in fact abolitionists. We knew that. This place was built in 1858. Time frame sort of works. And maybe there was a underground passage here. But anyways, Paul Finkelman came and um, the prize for me was the luncheon speaker was a French connection, René Robert was our speaker and incredibly articulate. And all these sports guys could tell war stories with the best of them and funny. And we filmed him. Again, I'm looking at Ed as he's filming me now, but it's all on YouTube. Thank God we did all those because you, you could have a comedy hour and then some with just those guys alone. And they were always well covered. Uh, later in October of 2014, we had something called Tinkering with the Law. We were really blessed to have Mary Beth Tinker here. Mary Beth Tinker uh, uh, is a named plaintiff in a Supreme Court case Tinker, for, Tinker versus uh, Des Moines, and she talked about First Amendment rights. It dealt with Vietnam. She was wearing an armband which supported the removal of troops from, and she did that in school, and of course was, a lim was told to go home, and that led to a litigation, and the Tinker case is very, very famous. So we were very fortunate to have Mary Beth come here the night before and then do a CLE. And um, uh, we were, we were, that was really cool, tinkering with the law. And the speaker that damn time was Ed Rutkowski. Ed, former county executive, former player with the Buffalo Bills back in the early days of the 60s. Uh, he was one of the guys who uh, played many positions from a running back to a wide receiver, and when a couple of the quarterbacks, Kemp and LaMonica, got hurt in those early days, he was the quarterback. Uh, and so to have him here. Now, how did we get Edward Kowski? Uh, the head of the county of Chautauqua IDA was working with Ed. Ed was a consultant for a, a law firm, and he was trying to pitch their services. So I knew that. So I prevailed upon our, my client of the, my firm, uh, well, if, why don't you invite Ed down and we'll show him all around, but it's, we'll provide him lunch, and, but he's got to speak. He's going to have to be interviewed. So again, as we have on other occasions, you know, used connections to get folks who otherwise would not be available. So that was Ed Redkowski. In 2015, it was the 50th year of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So we had a program, and it was again, packed house because we used history, 50th anniversary, and Brian Howard spoke on the Civil Rights Act. We had uh, reflections on the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Robert Fine, an attorney in Buffalo who was an intern in Alabama, he spoke. 
uh, David Lawless, Lawless rather, L-O-L-I-S, from Chautauqua Institution, who spoke on his times in Mississippi, and Ruben Ortenberg, who was with the Department of Justice during that 60s civil rights time period where there was a lot of civil rights activities, but at the same time, they were trying to register people to vote, and by registering to vote, all kinds of things happened. So we were blessed to have three people who were part of the actual activity here. And so that was history. Like Mary Beth Tinker being a plaintiff, these folks were here as well. And Ruben Ordenberg had such a good time that he shortly thereafter called me and introduced me to one of his senior partners who I'll talk about in just a second. Our speaker, sports celebrity speaker, was Larry Playfair of the Buffalo Sabres. And Larry was the head of the Buffalo Sabres Alumni Association. Again, these guys could not be more gracious. Uh, did we pay them a, a stipend, a modest stipend, which they gave to the Sabres Alumni Association, uh, which we always got sponsored by somebody. So. Again, that was Larry Playfair. The next one we had was uh, John Ward, who was our county court judge, had just retired. So we thought, wouldn't it be great to do a retrospective? So we picked a date, which was good for Judge Ward, and we had all the court systems shut down. County court, Supreme Court, because they all wanted to come to hear this. So led by, moderated by Judge Cass, and included a panel which consisted of uh, a, a number of uh, attorneys, uh, Paul Andrews, Kevin Lawmer, Neil Robinson, Dick Slater, moderated by Judge Cass. The place was packed. We could have gone on for 10 hours. They were told war stories about Judge Ward, as a, who was a district attorney, and then subsequently county uh, court judge, uh, 40 years serving our county. The speaker at that time was Mike Robitaille. And Mike Robitaille, who was an announcer with the Sabres, color analyst, but at the same time uh, played with the Sabres for many years. But at the time I didn't realize he was having a uh, real health issues and he was in this negotiations, sometimes very bitter, and he was very open and very poignant about uh, what had happened to him and how the Sabres were treating him, and he didn't think very well. And he did that all pretty candidly and in front of a, a live audience and in front of Ed Tomasini filming it. So you can see that. Anyways, Mike uh, open, bared his soul, uh, and he, he's, he's always known as a rough and tough guy, and, 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 he, and he did it incredibly well. The next one uh, we did was called Security the Next Frontier because everybody's cyber hacking, became a really big issue. And um, so we brought down cybersecurity, data privacy, espionage, uh, you know, how, how they use this. So what we did, we had, um, I thought, you know, what would be fun is to tie in current concerns about espionage, essentially taking your data, with a uh, <coughs> current movie that was out called The Bridge of Spies. Turns out The Bridge of Spies is a 1957 case <coughs> which dealt with conspiracy, espionage of a Russian during the Cold War in Washington, D.C. Ultimately, he gets uh, arrested, tried, and convicted. Now, it turns out the guy who was the assistant district attorney in 1957 was a partner of Reuben Ordenberg. Remember I talked about Reuben? Well, he introduced me to Anthony Palermo. And so he came down, and so I interviewed Anthony Palermo about that Bridge of Spies. And in fact, we showed the movie, The Bridge of Spies, the night before at the Reg Linnae. So we tied in the event coupled with the next day. It worked out really well. Well, so that was one hour. Then on top of that, uh, we invited down Jerry Meehan. Jerry Meehan was the former general manager of the Buffalo Sabres, player with the Sabres, and a broadcaster in, in Toronto. 
And Jerry, also a lawyer, uh, came and talked about, remember, Alexander Mogilny, Bob Suedos? Well, it turned out Suedos was the attorney, Meehan was the general manager who had to travel to, ultimately, it was in Sweden, Switzerland, I'm not sure which, and there's kind of grab from a hotel room, Mogilny. Well, Mogilny was willing to do this, but they had to get him out from the, the Russian Army hockey team. The other guy was Don Luce, who comes up later. Um, so we had espionage, we had cybersecurity, we had Rudolph Abel and Bridge of Spies, we had the Mogilny story. Unbelievable. It turns out the guy who prosecuted him, Rudolph Abel, was a guy named James Donovan, and James Donovan, prior to prosecuting in 1957, was a Nuremberg prosecutor with Robert Jackson. So Jackson, Donovan, Palermo, trying, Rudolph Abel, Bridge of Spies, Espionage, Russians, and then all of a sudden, more recently, Buffalo, Russian Mogilny, Jerry Meehan, crazy. And that, and the speaker, luncheon speaker was Marty Baran, another announcer, f uh, former goaltender, probably the most, probably the funniest guy we've ever had. He just had more stories you shake a stick at. Uh, it, it would be great. I forgot to mention, during this whole montage of people, because we really ratcheted up our game ever since Woodstock. So this was the, the I forgot, John Colhane was brought in. He was a special agent of the FBI, and he was the management oversight for the development of the Buffalo FBI post 9-11 strategic priorities. And he was the guy involved with Dr. Slepian, uh, who was tried in, as an FBI agent. Uh, Colhane came here too. So we had Slepian, story, Rudolph Abel, Alexander Mogil, it was just chock full. How do we, how do we even get close to that? Uh, again, now this bar has been set so high, the next one was scandals and conspiracies. Now again, the crowd is bar association because they want the CLE credits, but now the place is really being populated by the community. What's next? And this one dealt with the Black Sox scandal. You know, we had a good friend of mine who wrote a book on the Black Sox scandal, Chuck Fountain, he came and I interviewed him. And then we had, we had set up uh, Brent Isaacson talking about, uh, he was an FBI guy, talking about various things that were going on in human trafficking, so on and so forth here in the, uh, in the community. And the featured speaker was a, a buff, former Buffalo Sabre named Craig Muni, uh, who we were able to get because his real estate agency, he was a, he's a real estate agent, uh, sent him down. And Craig was great. And he had played with Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier, in those golden years of the Edmonton Oilers. So a, a really cool do thing. Next thing we did was 2017, Superfund. And I knew that that's a hot ticket, Superfund dealing with brown fields, et cetera. But at all, it's Niagara Falls. It's Love Canal. But our firm was involved in the defense work for uh, Love Canal, and so we knew some players. And so I reached out to the congressman at the time, John LaFaults. I reached out to, uh, um, uh, to come and to talk about the life and times of how issues become law and then we had a whole section dealing with how Superfund changed the world, how it went from a really bad thing where you couldn't develop anything anywhere to brownfield credits, encouraging people to get money to develop property to its evolution today. And so we had developers, we had John LaFalse, <coughs> who told nothing but war stories of how he got Jimmy Carter involved in Superfund legislation. But again, the place is packed because of the subject matter. Our speaker then was Denny Lynch. Denny Lynch had just written a book on his 35 years of being 
Director of Public Relations for the Buffalo Bills. Again, war stories galore. Denny Lynch. <laughs> then we did a, one called the Supreme Court of the State of New York Appellate Division, Fourth Judicial Department. And I don't know how the hell we got so silly credits, but we had the, uh, we got the presiding justice of the appellate division, huge in the New York State court system, Judge Whalen, we had Judge Peridotto, and Judge Curran. How did we that happen? Peeling back the onion, John Curran, who was a now and a fourth department appellate division judge, formerly was a, uh, a partner of mine at Phillips Lytle. So, Previously, I was at a St. Bonaventure basketball game. We, Jackson Center does work with Bonaventure. So they were playing Dayton, which is one of their rivals, at Olean. <laughs> and I'm there, and of course, turns out Dayton is very good, and they won. So I'm leaving. Who do I see but Judge Curran? And I said, John, how are you? Greg, how are you? You know, banalities. And I said, by the way, you need to bring down the fourth department to the Jackson Center. He goes, why not? You're chairman, judge. Now he's judge again. See what that happens. So he, that day, or that next day, he went in and talked to the chief judge, President Judge Whalen. He says, let's make it happen. So we created three people come down. And we did a panel on what it's like to be in arguing before the court. It was just terrific. Um, and that preceded something that would come up a little bit later, which was in fact a, <coughs> no, no. the entire appellate division came here, and behind my curtain is a huge bench, uh, which was funded by Art Bailey, thank you Art, uh, which three hours was here filming and arguing the appellate division. You don't have to go to Rochester. It was here. Unprecedented. Never had happened before. Place was packed with lawyers and people, and it was incredible. Just incredible. Um, that came a little bit later in 2018, but nevertheless. 2000, the last part of 2017, we had free expression in the scope of the First Amendment, a conversation with Floyd Abrams. <clears throat> in the world of First Amendment, there's nobody bigger than Floyd Abrams. He is the attorney extraordinaire <coughs> who represented New York Times and the Sullivan versus New York Times. And uh, uh, how did we get him? Well, it turned out that the supervisor of the town of Arkwright is a lawyer, at least was a lawyer, retired retired to Arkwright and got involved in community activities and that's where the wind farms are in Arkwright. So in the course of a conversation with me many years ago, he said, by the way, my roommate at law school was Floyd Abrams. Uh, you're kidding me. The Floyd Abrams? Yes. So fast forward, a lot of things were going on in and Floyd Abrams had a book out. He just a book. I said, gee, it'd be great to have him here. I don't even know how to get him. So I called my good friend in the town of Arkwright. And he said, give me the information. I'll reach out to him. And so I did. He did. And on a Sunday morning, I get a call from Floyd Abrams. Saying, Greg, I'm Floyd Abrams. I understand. I just got a letter yesterday from my good friend. And he says, you would be interested in, in having me come to the Jackson Center. And I'm a big fan of Jackson. Whoa. So long story short, he came here. Place is packed, especially with lawyers. The UB and, and even Pittsburgh came up to see Floyd Abrams. And I had no problems getting a high-end uh, Samantha Barbas from the Buffalo Law School just to introduce him. She just wanted to be close to it. So that was a big day with Floyd Abrams here. And the speaker was a Buffalo Bills recently retired, Pat Coletta, another tough guy who was a Sabres, but Pat came down, and, and that, was, that was terrific. Um, again, the bar is getting higher and higher and higher. After Woodstock, the, the, the days of just doing 
trust and estates and wills and charitable annuities. People expect so much more. The pressure was on to do high-end CLE. Well, at, through Chautauqua Institution, a friend, I got to know Jonathan Eig. Jonathan Eig had written a couple books on Lou Gehrig, Al Capone, and um, a very well known, in, he was from Chicago, but he was at Chautauqua Institution to give a couple lectures. I got a chance to interview him, and we just got to know each other. He's younger than me. But he hit the big time on a book on Muhammad Ali. I mean, really hit the big time. All the national media grabbed it. So I reached out to him now thinking, what the heck? Uh, if he was on a book tour, I'd love to have him here to interview him about his book. Uh, and so he agreed. And it's called, we entitled it, Shadow Boxing with History, Muhammad Ali's Test of Civil Liberties. Now we had to finesse the law part of this, but it turns out Ali was in a Supreme Court case. Of course, to box, you have to have a legal license. You know, we created law. And we then packed the, with Muhammad Ali, we packed it with Don Elbaum, who was a, uh, actually was a promoter. And Don, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend the interview we did with him. He's right out of central casting. Pug nose, grass, gravelly voice, a guy who promoted Sugar Ray Robinson, Muhammad Ali, a variety of boxers, and, and has stories galore. Oh my gosh. And some of them which he could tell, some of which he told us later, which are, is also on YouTube. But we had Don Elbaum. On top of that, we had Jonathan Eig, award winning author. And on top of that, we had baby Joe Macy come back, undefeated heavyweight. So we had an undefeated heavyweight on the panel together with Jonathan Ig talking about Muhammad Ali. And Jonathan Ig, who had done many, many, many promotions throughout the country, felt that particular day was the best one ever, as far as he was concerned. He was so thrilled with the, the combination of people, uh, the dinners that we had the night before, getting to kibitz with Baby Joe and Don Elbaum and the stories we told about a lot of things. Our luncheon speaker was a guy named Ron Zeller. He was the founder and former CEO of uh, Meritan Health, but he um, had written a book called All In, which talked about Buffalo and his involvement in Buffalo sports and owning uh, or being uh, uh, the, in charge of Buffalo's uh, stadium for a long period of time and how that happened, kind of behind the curtain. Now again, the bar just continued to be very high. Uh, it was Steve Cass who suggested, why don't we do something on Attica? Attica, it was an anniversary when the Attica riots occurred. And there had a book, had been a book out, uh, authored by Pulitzer Prize winning Heather Ann Thompson. Now, I didn't think we could get Heather Ann Thompson, but I give Steve Cass credit. Why not? I'll, I'll get her phone number, we'll do a joint call, which really means he'll call, he'll call the number and then I'll, I'll talk, which I did, and she agreed to come. And we, had, we really rearranged our schedule so she could come, and so she came and spoke about her book. We had Lee Coppola here, who actually covered Attica, and Lee Coppola, a very well-known investigative reporter, and also subsequently uh, head of the journalism school at St. Bonaventure. So he could talk about it with Heather Ann Thompson. And then we had the uh, uh, special agent in charge of the Buffalo Field Office for the FBI, uh, Gary Lofford, who talked about FBI and prison reform and the vestiges of Attica. Now, in addition, when we talked about Attica, it turned out in the crowd were uh, a couple lawyers who were involved in doing, as uh, Paul Webb Jr. was in law school and he was hired to do internship work to uh, in, uh, interview the prisoners who were subject to civil rights violations. Um, we had an attorney from Buffalo who was here uh, who, uh, uh, drove around, um, oh, 
famous attorney, civil rights attorney, who was one of the defendants. So his job was uh, to drive him around, and I, I, I can't believe I'm blanking. But they were here, so we had them come up and tell their stories. And it was just, just a hoot. And on top of that packed house, we had Don Luce, again, sabers of the golden years with the French Connection, but also was the uh, director of player personnel with uh, Jerry Meehan going to Moscow. So again, it's Bob Suedos, Jerry Meehan, Don Luce. So Don talked at length about going to Moscow and getting Mogilny. Meehan separately said the same thing, different things, but different perspective. So we have the story. We have the story. So now, we got a little crazy. Our next one was called uh, The Fall of the Buffalo Mob. That really packed the place. Because uh, now we're talking about the mafia and the Buffalo Mob and the Mesrodinos. And some people had stories about the Mesrodinos. And we, we brought in a panel discussion where we had Anthony Bruce, who was a former assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District, talking about the mob, does it still exist? Judge Sal Martocci, uh, who was a character and was uh, uh, part of uh, a movie about Buffalo, and uh, he, he was here along with Lee Coppola, again, who broke the story on the mob and the Mesrodino. So all three of them were here, and it was unbelievable, unbelievable. And um, our luncheon speaker was Alan Bozer, which was a partner of mine, is a partner of mine, and Alan uh, uh, talked about Palermo, Italy, to Niagara Falls, about uh, the mob assist coming from Sicily into the United States and landing in Buffalo. So he had his whole thing was the mob. Uh, by the way, Judge Martocci was actually portrayed in the movie Hiding in Plain Sight. So we showed pieces of that movie as well. So the whole thing, the fall of the Buffalo mob, and it was packed, packed house. Uh, we got a little more uh, sober the next time with solar and distributed energy opportunities and challenges, which dealt with solar energy. A hot topic, still is. And so we had uh, uh, many years of, uh, of talking about that, in addition to having a special event called 40 Years of Family Court, uh, which again, like we did with John Ward, this was Family Court where 40 years worth of Family Court judges were on a panel uh, moderated by Judge Cass. It was Judith Clare, Lynn Hartley, Jeff Piaz, and Mike Sullivan. Fantastic, fantastic. And our speaker, uh, what turned out to be the last one before COVID kicked in, was Nellie Drew. Nellie Drew uh, is the University of Buffalo School of Law professor. And uh, as a young lawyer, was an associate with Bob Suedos. And remember, Bob Suedos, Mo Gilney, corporate counsel, Jerry Meehan, uh, Don Luce, well, it turns out the fourth party behind the curtain doing all the legal work for Bob Suedos in the Mogilny case was Nellie Drew. So unwittingly, under four separate occasions, we have the whole Mogilny story. So for some intern watching this, if they want to piece together a documentary from the four talking heads, uh, Suedos, Drew, Mian and Luce, you can get that. So um, that is the story of continuing legal education. What we did was to film it. We gave CLE credits through Phillips Lytle. Most importantly, Mary Keating at Tomasini did all the filming, made it available. We put it up on YouTube. Uh, so many of the programs are there now. Uh, and it's been uh, a delight, but uh, I thought I'd pause 
And I'm glad we're doing this now because it's kind of a chunk of our programming from 2005 to really 2020, which I miss, candidly, uh, because of COVID, but maybe someday we'll actually have a chance to, to rifle it up again. But if not, that's a little bit behind the scenes. So thank you, Ed Tomasini, for filming this. Yeah.